We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead. His kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And we believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Spirit dwelling within us. And he continues, 
So then, brothers, we are, no, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him, in order that we may also be glorified with him. And finally, this reading from the Gospel of John, a very familiar text, John chapter 3, the first 17 verses. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. We'll finish our reading from God's Word here and turn to our study in the Shorter Catechism, looking at questions numbers 70 through 72. We have looked at the command against murder uh, in, in our last uh, study, and now we go to the seventh commandment, and we'll read uh, the questions regarding that commandment. Which is the seventh commandment? The answer is, the seventh commandment is, thou shalt not commit adultery. Question 71, what is required in the seventh commandment? The answer, the seventh commandment requireth the preservation of our own and our neighbor's chastity in heart, speech, and behavior. Question 72. What is forbidden in the seventh commandment? 
The answer, the seventh commandment, forbiddeth all unchaste thoughts, words, and actions. The word chastity is an old word that we don't often hear very much anymore. It's old-fashioned. It comes back from the days of our Puritan forefathers. And so a, a word like that sometimes is scoffed and mocked at in our modern world. But it's a word that reflects on the requirement that God has upon us to be chaste and pure in our conduct, in our lives, uh, with each other. And so this morning we come to consider the seventh commandment, which has to do with, uh, more broadly, the committing of adultery. The language here for adultery is a general term which includes all different forms of sexual sin. We can go through a, a lengthy list of such sins. There are many examples of that today, of course. But uh, we would begin with the sin of fornication where some might consider living with someone else or engaging in sexual relationships outside of the marriage relationship that would come under this command. And so that would be uh, forbidden. We also consider adultery itself, that is unfaithfulness to your marital partner, whereby you have a relationship with somebody who's not your partner, and you break your uh, vows of Fidelity to your partner by uh, having sexual relations with another individual. And that too would form a break of this commandment. Uh, you may also consider various other forms of unchan unchaste behavior. Uh, there is the Old Testament speaks against bestiality, uh, sexual relationships with animals. Uh, that seems like the uh, most outrageous thing, but apparently some are tempted in that way. And so uh, that too is forbidden. And then finally, of course, you have what is described in Scripture as an abomination, uh, homosexual relationships. And so it's rather striking that what we today might find as uh, awful, distasteful, uh, bestiality is trumped by homosexuality as uh, described as an abomination before God. One might not think in those terms, but uh, all of these are violations of God's law here uh, given to us in this seventh commandment. And so the commandment has, as we often consider, both positive and negative requirements for us. Positively, we should do what we can to preserve our own and our, our neighbor's chastity. And so we need to be very careful about how we relate to each other and be sure that we honor the marriage relationships that God has blessed us with. Uh, that goes to every aspect of life, from our outward behaviors to the kinds of things we say and even uh, the thoughts that are entertained within our hearts. Jesus uh, in his Sermon on the Mount, of course, warns us against the sin of adultery as it is expressed in sinful desires, lustful desires. And so even there, God expects purity, chastity of heart. And of course, it's the heart where things begin, and so the Word of God urges us to uh, guard our hearts and to uh, render our hearts in purity before God. So. Uh, positively and negatively, we are to avoid those kinds of things which would corrupt and pollute us and which bring harm. Uh, there are a wide variety of applications of that to our modern age. Uh, it used to be that uh, pastors would uh, point out the uh, dangers of engaging in pornography or picking up the Playboy magazine or a penthouse or that sort of thing. Today, with the internet, you've got all kinds of things available there that you need to be uh, watching for. And so, um, there are all kinds of sources that would encourage uh, sinful thoughts and worse, sinful behaviors. And so, we need to walk by the Spirit, as Paul urges us in Romans chapter 8, and be ha having our minds set on the Spirit. 
And so if your mind is thinking on spiritual things, focusing on pleasing God, seeing God as beautiful and His Word as a delight, and allowing His Spirit to guide you in life, then that will help to protect you from the different forms of temptation that are active in the world today. Uh, Christ is faithful to us as our great bridegroom. He is the husband to the church, his bride, and he is ever faithful to us. He has laid down his life for us and for our salvation. And so therefore we should look to him uh, for strength in our relationships to be faithful there and strength too to walk in a godly way before him. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer and bring our request to Him at this time. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank You for Your mercies to us. We thank You that You are gracious and forgiving, and that You hear us when we repent of our sins and cry out to You for cleansing from the pollution and corruption of our sins. We present our hearts to You uh, in all of our uh, weaknesses, frailties, and sins. Pray that you would forgive us for uh, those ways in which we have dishonored you and uh, acted in ways which are displeasing to you. We pray for your Spirit's work in our lives, that we would be more and more conformed to the image of our Savior, the Lord Jesus, who loves us and gave himself for us in faithfulness to his charge and to his commitment to be our Savior. We thank you, Father, for this church and for your blessing on us. We thank you for your mercies and grace and we do pray that your spirit would be upon us. We pray that you would strengthen the ministry of uh, your word here. Help us to grow in wisdom and in knowledge and understanding. Help us, O oh Lord, to know you, to know you intimately, personally, to hear your word speak to us and to be led by the counsel of your spirit speaking through scripture. We pray, Lord, that you would help us be mindful of how your word applies to all of life and help us, Lord, to be sensitive to the leading of your spirit in the various um, circumstances of life. Father, we pray for your blessing on us that we might grow in compassion, grace, kindness, goodness. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to be mindful of those who are in need among us and around us. Help us, Lord, to do that which we can for your glory and praise. Father, we pray that you would uh, be with those who are in our midst, who are needy. We pray, Lord, that you would bring uh, renewed health and healing to many of those who are beset by age and, and infirmity. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, minister your grace to each one. We pray that you would be with Ella and George McLaren. We pray, Lord, that you would preserve their health and strength. We thank you for their faithfulness in coming to worship you. Uh, Sunday after Sunday. We thank you, Lord, for your mercies to them and pray that your spirit would sustain them by grace. We pray for others who are unable to attend. Uh, we pray for Eve Thomas and for Larry Handy and for others, um, Kathy Martin, uh, Rhoda, and Manuel. We pray, Lord, that you would minister to them and their needs uh, through your word. We pray for Heidi, that you would uh, bless and provide for her and her healing. We pray, Lord, for those who are remote at some distance from us. We thank you for Chuck and Tamara and for Chuck's parents, Chuck Sr. and Pauline, and pray for your blessing and provision for them. We do pray as well, Lord, for uh, uh, others who are at some distance from us and unable to attend. We pray for Jack and Linda Kimmel, uh, for Aaron and Heather Boxstein, and for others who may desire to be a part of our fellowship but are unable to. We pray for your blessing on them by your spirit. Father, we pray that you would be with us here who attend your services and worship you in person. We thank you for preserving our health and strength over this past year. We thank you, Lord, that we have not suffered loss uh, in view of the pandemic. Uh, we do pray, Lord, that you would preserve us and strengthen us for our days. We pray that you bless our fellowship around your word and uh, show us the glory of our Savior. We pray for our foreign missionaries. We thank you for them. And we pray for Mark uh, Ridgeline and his wife. We pray, Lord, that you would bless them in their service in Montevideo. 
Uruguay. We thank you, Lord, for their uh, efforts to uh, gather your people to worship uh, after a time of online services because of the uh, pandemic there. We pray, Lord, that as they make efforts to return to in-person services, both morning and evening, that your blessing would be on, on that. We pray for a ruling elder there named Juan, that you would be pleased to heal him and strengthen him as he is in the hospital. We pray, Lord, that you would restore his health and strength, uh, especially as he suffers from hemophilia. We pray, Lord, for your blessing on uh, their ministry overall. We pray, Lord, that you would add to the numbers those that should be saved. We thank you for possible elder candidates who are able to uh, potentially serve in as Mark seeks to lead them and bless them. We pray for your uh, work, uh, the work of your spirit in their hearts and lives. As he uh, has a leadership training class, Lord, we do pray for your blessing on that. Lord, we thank you for others who serve across the world today. We pray that you would strengthen and bless them in their many uh, efforts, and we pray that you would be glorified in them. We thank you for our uh, Orthodox Presbyterian Church and its various ministries. We thank you for the renewed health of uh, our General Secretaries. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to watch over Danny Oliver and his recovery. Uh, bless Al Tricarico and his health needs. And we pray, Lord, for John Shaw, that you would guide and bless him as he seeks to advance the work of your church around our country. Father, we pray for Mark Bew and his efforts at uh, leading our foreign missions efforts. We pray, Lord, that you would bless and provide for him. We thank you for the many ways in which you watch over us, Lord. We thank you for uh, marriage and for the blessings of marriage, the joy that comes to us. We thank you that you make provision for us, that our marriages would be joyful and happy, and that we would uh, delight in each other. We thank you for Rick and Lois and for their years of marriage. We do thank you for your faithfulness to them through uh, the years and their various um, forms of ministry to your church. Uh, we thank you for their sons and for their families. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless Rick and Lois as they celebrate their uh, wedding anniversary. Pray that it be a time of great joy and thanksgiving for your blessings on them in life. Father, we pray that you be with Ryan as he uh, undergoes surgery in the weeks to come. We pray that that would go well. We pray for your blessing on him and providing him with work. And pray, Lord, that uh, you would strengthen him and provide for his needs. Thank you for Mike and Pat and pray for your blessing on them. Pray for healing for Pat, for the uh, blessing of your spirit with love and joy and peace. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, deliver her from uh, feelings of of sorrow and uh, distress. We pray, Lord, for your hand of healing on her. And Father, we pray for others who may be suffering in different ways. We pray that you would bless and provide for each one. We pray for Justin and Tim as they enter into the membership of First Church. We pray that as we receive them next Sunday that your blessing would be on them. And pray, Lord, that you would uh, bless them, uh, that they might be a blessing to others as well. We thank you for your word and spirit, and we would ask that you would teach us to pray, even as our Lord taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our next hymn is number 500, excuse me, 607. Thy loving kindness, Lord, is good and free. Hymn number 607. Please stand to sing.
But he said, you are idle. You are idle. That is why you say, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Go now and work. No straw will be given you, but you must still deliver the same number of bricks. The foremen of the people of Israel saw that they were in trouble, for they said, You shall by no means reduce your number of bricks, your daily task each day. They met Moses and Aaron, who were waiting for them as they came out from Pharaoh. And they said to them, Lord, look on you and judge, because you have made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants, and put a sword in their hand to kill us. And Moses turned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people. And you have not delivered your people at all. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your work. And we thank you for your work in history and time. And the way that you sovereignly, graciously, and purposefully accomplish your will. We would ask that your spirit would bless us as we look into this text. We pray that the glory of our mediator Jesus would be manifested and magnified for us, that we might be encouraged and have hope in this our day of struggle. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Things seem to be off to a great start. When Moses and Aaron returned to Egypt, they met with the leaders of Israel and explained to them that God had called them to rescue Israel from Egypt. It is a wild, dramatic plan that they had there, but the elders of Israel responded positively. They were happy to hear this great word that God had not forgotten them, but now he finally would send them a deliverer, Moses, and rescue them from their bondage, their sore bondage in Egypt. And so with great hope and expectation, with the promise of God that he was going to deliver Israel out of Egypt, Moses and Aaron appear before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now we don't know exactly how they managed to get an audience with Pharaoh. Maybe it was that some within his household knew of Moses and recognized him and were willing to give him an audience with Pharaoh. Maybe it was because they <coughs> represented a major population in Egypt a slave population, but a source of tremendous work and profit for Egypt. And so Pharaoh wanted to know what was on their minds. In any case, they have an opportunity to meet with the Pharaoh of Egypt. And what a moment this would be. Here you have Moses, the great law, who would be the great lawgiver of Israel, the one who would be a great prophet of God, and the one through whom God would do amazing things, standing now before the Pharaoh of Egypt, one who was considered to be somewhat superhuman, even godlike. He was possessed of the god Horus, and upon his death he was to rise again as Osiris. Uh, he was a descendant of the sun god, Ray, uh, who created the, the, the earth. And so Pharaoh stands not really as an earthly king of a populous nation, but he stands as a lord and a god and a monarch over the world. And so you have these two conflicting forces coming together. The kingdom of God coming to, if you will, a point with Moses and the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of paganism, revealed in Pharaoh, manifested in Pharaoh of that day. It's clear that Pharaoh himself was in, in, engaged in the occult and he worshipped, he had people worshipping himself. In fact, the word used for, that God uses for Israel coming out to serve him in the wilderness, to take part in a festival. 
That word for serve is the same word used to describe Israel's service to Pharaoh as they engaged in their slave labor. It was their form of worship to Pharaoh, the great God. We'll see coming later on how Pharaoh calls upon his uh, wise men and sorcerers to engage with Moses and Aaron and this staff that they put upon the ground and turns into a snake. And so there are demonic forces at work in Egypt, working through the sorcerers and the magical uh, acts that they are able to perform. We should be reminded that Satan is able to do lying wonders, things which are amazing to see, perhaps kind of like starships in the heavens, that kind of thing that we're seeing in the news today. Lying wonders. Satan is at work in different ways. So, you have this great moment. And Moses comes with Aaron. He has the staff of God in his hand. He has God's commission upon him. He has the support of Israel behind him. He has word from God, the assurance that all his enemies are gone. And so he appears before Pharaoh with great confidence. And he says, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go, that they may worship me. And so Pharaoh, or Moses, uh, comes with the full authority of God's servant to Pharaoh. One might hope that Pharaoh would have been compliant enough to wish to understand a little bit about what Moses had in mind here and who was this God that Moses was representing. But really, for Pharaoh, when he hears that Moses says, thus says the Lord, let my people go, Pharaoh's got to be thinking to himself, ha, you got to be kidding me. The God of my slaves is telling me that I need to let them go? Where has this God been? His people are enslaved to me. What do I need to fear of this kind of God? whose people are so degraded and humble that they cannot do anything without my permission. And so Pharaoh, being the God of Egypt, dismisses any recognition of the God of the Hebrews. He even goes on to say, I don't even know who this God is. Now, that is something of a false statement. Perhaps he's not heard the name Yahweh before. Surely, however, he knew about Israel. He knew something about their, their past. He knew something about their God. Is it not possible that there were some stories yet remaining in Egypt of Joseph? and how God had given dreams to a previous pharaoh about a famine and times of plenty and so forth that spared Egypt from great disaster? Did he not know these things from his own history? Well, in any case, it's not simply that he might not have been cognizant of his own history, but he was denying his own creatureliness before God. He might in arrogance and in pomp say, I don't know who this Lord is, and why should I serve him? But in fact, deep down in his heart, because he's yet made in the image of God, he knows who the true God is. All of mankind, though they reject God, resist him, deny that they know him, Nonetheless, deep down, they have a sense of the divine. And they wish to rebel against this God. I was reminded as, as I was looking at this text of a comment made by Aldous Huxley in one of his books. He writes about how it was that he and others with him rejected the idea of a universe with meaning to it. And claimed that the universe did not make any sense at all. And he was 
being quite frank, brutally frank about it. He said, the reason why we postulated the meaninglessness of the world was because if we agree that the world had meaning, then there must be someone who gives it meaning. There is a specific rejection of Christianity and its place in the world as an interpreter of all things. And Aldous Huxley goes on to say, the reason why we, we rejected this is because we did not want to serve this God. We wanted to be able to do what we wanted to do. And if there is a God who is the creator of all things, who uh, gives meaning to the universe, then we are subject to him. And that we can't have. And so, in, in the end, Aldous Huxley says we like to have sex, too. And this God would not allow us to do whatever we please in that regard. And so therefore, we postulate that the world is meaningless. You see, deep down, within the heart of man, there is a recognition that there is a God, that it is the Lord who is God, and they suppress that knowledge within their own hearts. Paul tells us this in Romans chapter 1. You've read it many times, I'm sure, how God has revealed His nature, His divine nature and power in the things which are created. He's made Himself known abundantly in all things, and yet the creature rejects this knowledge of God, suppresses it in unrighteousness, and refuses to submit to God. That is the nature of the human heart. Lives in rebellion against God. And so Pharaoh puffs himself up, declares that essentially he is the sovereign, and he does not bow to the Lord God, the God of Israel, and he would oppose any such idea. Now, Moses comes with what would seem to be, if you're reading this text in the light of previous chapters, something of a misdirection. Uh, Moses comes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go, that they may go out into the wilderness and uh, take part in a festival for three days, and then they'll come back. And uh, we know from what God has said to Moses already, that God's ultimate plan was to bring Israel completely out of Egypt. Was this a misrepresentation of God's wishes? Well, no. It was a test of Pharaoh, a small test which would reveal his heart. God makes a minimal request of Pharaoh that he would let the Israelites go for a festival out in the wilderness for a three-day period of time. Would Pharaoh even acknowledge that? There is history uh, in the annals of Egypt of uh, populations within Egypt making similar requests to go out to hold a religious festival for a period of time, and those were generally granted. But in this case, Pharaoh was unwilling to allow such a thing to occur. You remember that God had told Moses as he approached Pharaoh that I'm going to harden his heart. And he will not willingly allow Israel to leave. And so God, who is the great creator of all, is pleased to harden Pharaoh's heart make him resistant to God's will, and therefore hold him up while God shows to Pharaoh and to all the world, to us today, his great power over this arrogant man. Some wonder about God's hardening the heart of Pharaoh, but indeed, as Paul says in Romans chapter 1, God is pleased to harden some. He has compassion on whom he has compassion, and he hardens others. It's his right as the creator. He creates the heavens and the earth. They are his possession. He can make one vessel for honorable use, and another vessel for dishonorable use. It's his prerogative. He is God. 
Paul says, who are you to question God? Who are you to say to God, why have you made, you, made me like this? God is God. And there's a point where we must leave these kinds of things into God's hands. At the same time, we can say, Pharaoh himself hardened his own heart, his own sinful rebellion. His heart was already given over to sin, and he would not submit to God because his nature was bound by his sin. And so Pharaoh hardens his own heart. God, in his justice, just confirms that and gives him over to increasing hard, hardness of heart so that God's wrath would be revealed against Pharaoh and against Egypt. And so this first meeting between Moses and Pharaoh does not live up to its billing in terms of what the Israelites might have been expecting. They might have been thinking that Moses will march in before Pharaoh, say, God says, let my people go. And Pharaoh, impressed by the presence of God, will comply. And in some way, God will make Pharaoh yield. I mean, we're told in Proverbs that the heart of the king is in the Lord's hands, and he turns it whichever way he wills. It may be that the Jews thought at this time, the Hebrews thought that God would just change the heart of Pharaoh, persuade him to let Israel go. You never know what God might do. Sometimes when God gives us a promise or an expectation of something happening in our lives, we think in terms of a straight line movement from where we are to what we want to achieve or what we want to receive. And we think that the promise just says that everything's going to go exactly as you might plan. But for Israel, God is pleased to make a promise that he will deliver them from Egypt, but it doesn't just immediately do it. God is going to cause Pharaoh to resist. And that will negatively impact Israel, as we'll see here in the text. Uh, Moses makes his request of Pharaoh. Pharaoh refuses. And Pharaoh does what tyrants do. He says, you are just looking for an excuse to get out of your work. You're lazy. I'm going to teach you for that. And so he requires them to make additional labors to accomplish the same end. He requires them to go out and get more straw. You might say that as Pharaoh looked at this latest request by Moses, that this was the last straw for his relationship to Israel. He was not going to provide them with any more straw. That's it. To roll out the images, this is the straw that broke the camel's back. That's the end of it. And so, uh, the, the Hebrews would have to scour around Egypt looking for stubble and straw that they could put together and use that to make their bricks with the quota remaining the same. So, they got the same quota for additional labor. Perhaps some of you have been in circumstances like that. I know that in my work in the past and in retail, it seemed like that was happening all the time. You have the same responsibility for selling certain things, but it, it, it increased responsibilities that you got to fulfill in order to make that uh, quota occur. And it seems like managing it just piles on more and more work. And uh, it gets to be very burdensome. That's what was happening here. Pharaoh was showing himself to be a tyrant. He was a man who was the head of the pagan state, a manifestation of the kingdom of darkness, the realm of Satan himself, the demonic realm. And it's a totalitarian system, a top-down system of oppression. Pharaoh acts without compassion for those who are underneath him. Pharaoh compels Israel to work harder and harder with no regard for their well-being or their safety or for what is even just and sensible. When the Jewish foremen come back to Pharaoh, and amazingly enough, 
appear before Pharaoh, and incidentally, they don't go through Moses. They've kind of had it with Moses. They go directly to your Pharaoh themselves. And say, why is it that you're expecting us to produce the same work and you're not giving us the support that we need? It was unreasonable. It was unfair. It was unjust. And they were being beat for failing to meet their quotas. Pharaoh had no regard for them. He had no regard for their well-being. And this is the way it is in the kingdom of Satan as it manifests itself in many different ways. It can manifest itself in totalitarian states that rise up in world history. I think we see some of that today, especially manifested in China. Uh, you see those who are seeking to impose their will upon their people without regard to the well-being of their own people. There's a genocide of the Muslim Uyghurs in China. There is the one, there had been the one child policy with the families to stop the growth of the population. All kinds of things have been done to harm the people and advance the interests of the Communist Party. Most recently, Christians in China have been required to adopt the Chinese uh, philosophy, the communist Chinese philosophy of, uh, of life. The Chairman Xi is requiring the Sino-Organization of Christianity in China. Uh, the pastors need to spout the principles of the Communist Party there in China. And so there's an attempt to suppress the Christian church in China in many different ways. This is how the kingdom of darkness manifests itself in history and time. Moses' difficult relationship with Pharaoh anticipates the appearance of the Christ himself, who does not appear before Pharaoh, but appears before Pontius Pilate, the representative of imperial Rome. And while Jesus did not appear before Caesar himself, Pontius Pilate was the representative of that empire, one might say, the evil empire. And it was before Pontius Pilate that Jesus gave the good confession, but nonetheless would be turned over to be crucified and would be beaten and crucified. And so Jesus comes before a totalitarian state and suffers underneath the impress of that state's boot. Jesus suffered on the cross for us. And then when Jesus turns in his ascension into glory and calls us into his service, he calls us to be ready to suffer for his sake. The Apostle Paul, the great missionary throughout Europe, would be commissioned by Christ on the road to Damascus and told that he would speak before kings and many of those who are in authority. And he would be beaten. And many evil things would happen to him. Eventually he would be executed for his service to Christ. Paul himself would say, if anyone, lives to, if anyone desires to be godly in Christ Jesus, he will be persecuted. And so, when the, the, the Hebrews in Egypt see Pharaoh resisting all reasonable appeals, even to his own financial well-being, because Pharaoh wasn't benefiting from this rule either. His production was going down because he was requiring too much of the Jews. It was his own fault that his own country was suffering. But this didn't matter to Pharaoh. It was a matter of power, a matter of pride. And so he forced his will upon the Jews. Well, the foremen who come out of this disastrous meeting with Pharaoh meet with Moses and Aaron on the way out. Probably they were solicitous to find out what had happened. And they basically said, God, visit you for all this. 
you've made us a stink in Pharaoh's nostrils. In other words, you've not done anything to help us out here. You've not made matters any better. In fact, you've made things worse. Now, can you imagine you're seeking to serve God, honor His will, and do that which is for the benefit of those you're serving, and what happens to them when things get worse, not better? That would be quite frustrating, upsetting. There are times when Satan is at work in your life where you are seeking to do something which is right and good. You're making a change in your life to honor God and His will. And rather than good things happening, bad things occur. It just seems that things get worse rather than better. In these times, God is testing your faith in Him and in His Word. Will you trust Him in these obscure circumstances? Will you trust Him to bring you through these difficult times? Will He be true to His Word and deliver you from the trouble, the problems that you are having? Israel needed to learn this lesson. In fact, God was disciplining His own people in Egypt for their own sins, their participation in idolatry, as you'll see later on in the prophets Ezekiel and Jeremiah, as they reflect on this time period. God disciplines His own people through His works of providence. But in this way, uh, Moses is humbled and embarrassed, if you will, by all that has happened. He seems to have had his authority undercut from him. And what can he do? But he turns to the Lord and prays. And he spills out his guts. Why have you done this? Things haven't gotten any better. There are times when you look to the heavens and you look for help, and help doesn't seem to have arrived. There's a promise of some hope and Hope never seems to come. And you have to wait. In these times, you have to trust in the Lord and in His purpose and goodness, even when you can't see it right in front of you. He hides a smiling purpose behind a frowning providence. I read a brief article by, I think it's Tom. Chalice, uh, I believe he's a professor at one of our reformed seminaries and a pastor as well. In any case, he talks about his life and talks about how his life seems to be filled with death and constant dying. And when I read his article, it's a brief article, a brief statement, uh, I anticipated what he was going to say in my own mind, and I was resonating with it, thinking of how it seems to me that I been having this thought recently, how life is the accumulation of different pains, different disappointments, different uh, sufferings that we go through, pain of a loss of different sorts, maybe a parent, a child, uh, a loved one, a uh, relationship falls apart. Uh, one pain after another, and it just seems to accumulate over time as you get older. Uh, Challenge was not Describe it so much in that way, but in the sense that he dies to his own dreams, to his own hopes. He had different ideas when he began his life and his ministry of the kinds of things he'd be able to achieve in life, the advances he'd be able to make, the contributions he'd be able to, to provide. And yet life was filled with obstacles and disappointments. And as he made his way through it, he wasn't as talented, as gifted as he thought he was. Uh, his dreams always remain rather remote and off in the distance. As he comes towards the end of his working career, perhaps, he thinks to himself, is this all there is? Perhaps you've had similar thoughts and feelings at times as well. You've begun life with ardent dreams, hopes and expectations, things that you wanted to accomplish in life. And yet with the passing of time, it seems that so much has been left behind. You've never been able to achieve everything that you wanted. And so there's something of an ache and a pain, a disappointment in life. Charles Spurgeon used to say, 
that God is no debtor to us. The kinds of things that we've sacrificed in this life, the things that we fail to obtain and achieve in this life, are things which were not necessary for us. God is pleased to work in our circumstances with his own purposes in mind, with his own agenda, on his own timetable. In fact, you will read, I believe it's in, in the book of Acts, uh, that Israel was delivered from Egypt after 430 years, and the phrase is, on that very day. And so, whereas Moses and Israel were looking for a quick escape out of Egypt, God says, I have my own timetable, my own plan, and things will be accomplished on my schedule. And we need to bow to that schedule and allow God to work through that until the right day comes. And there's coming a day for us when the things that we've lost in this life will be more than replaced. When we will enter into glory. Remember the disciples came to Jesus and said, what will there be for us? We've lost family and, and, and uh, lands and property and so forth. What will there be for us? And Jesus said, you'll have many times these things in this life and in the life to come, eternal life. God is no debtor to us. And so, when you lose certain things in this life, you find that God supplies in unexpected ways even here in this life. The psalmist says, I would have perished if I had not thought that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. There is goodness that God brings to our lives in ways we, which we had not expected. But at the same time, where is this land of the living? It's still yet before us, like Canaan was to Israel and Egypt. It was something out there. It was, if you will, an idea, a concept, but not a living reality. Not that they were experiencing at the moment. But God's promise was that he would deliver them and bring them. And so it is to us. He has a great future before us. Something far greater than what we experience here. And all the things that we've lost, all the things that we've sacrificed, giving of ourselves for our family, our friends, our church, our country, what have you, it will be more than abundantly returned to you because God is no, no, no debtor to us. He's a God of grace and abundance. I have come that they might have life, Jesus said, and have it abundantly. That's his promise. And so whatever difficulties we face, we can trust that he will fulfill his word. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and for the way that your, uh, your will works itself out in the course of history and time. As we who are subject to forces and things that happen which we don't always understand or anticipate, we, Lord, confess that we must uh, rest in you and look to you and be reminded that you are indeed the Lord, the God of Israel. We do pray that your blessing will be on us in times of uncertainty, of trouble, of sorrow, of pain. Help us, O oh Lord, to trust in you and in your great promises and to know that you will not fail, but you will do that which you have promised to your glory and praise and to the great salvation and joy of your people until we gather in that great festival to come, a great time of joy and the wedding supper of the Lamb. We ask for your blessing on us in Jesus' glorious name.
you, that you would receive them to your glory and praise and advance your work uh, in this place and around the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, let's sing our final hymn, number 311, Hail to the Lord's Anointed, number 311.